I encourage you to open to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where we will have our first passage this morning. We've been doing quite a, a long study on the church and trying to understand, and just understand the church better in different aspects of it. Last week we talked about a principle that we see in scripture that we need to be reminded of as we consider the purpose of the church and what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Last week we took time to consider the difference in responsibilities between the church and between us as individuals. The Bible teaches us that there are things that we are supposed to be doing as individuals, as Christians, and there are different things that the church can do, that the church has authority to do so. And there are many things that overlap in those things, but we also see there are differences between the two. And we took the time to understand that there are some things that we can do as individuals that we cannot do as the church, and there are some things that we ha we do specifically, uh, we have authority to do and follow that example in the church. And I want to talk about another one of those things this morning, and that is the subject of, uh, it's not turned on, I apologize, uh, of church benevolence. I want to take some time for us to look at the examples we have of church benevolence in the scriptures this morning and to look and see what, what did they do, what is the pattern that we see them following on the subject of church benevolence, and let's make some observations that we see from these passages this morning. So the first one we're going to look at is Acts chapter 2, and I have all the scriptures we're going to look at this morning up on the screen for you to follow in case you want to write them down, if you want to record these are the passages that talk about church benevolence, but we're going to go through these and make some observations on these passages this morning. So first we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Now I want to start off giving some context to each passage for us to understand what we're looking at here. In Acts chapter 2, we have the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost. The Apostle Peter, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is giving his first sermon here on the day of Pentecost. And we often read and quote Acts chapter 2 verse 38 where we, where we read, uh, when they, and when they were cut to the heart and they asked him, what, what the brothers asked him what he, they should do, and he responded to them that they needed to, re, to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. If we jump down a little further, we begin to see what they started to do as the church to begin with. Let's start reading in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. Now we want to look and, no and notice that what we're looking at here is we're having believers who are doing this for fellow believers. Again, we look and see uh, these are all believers who have just responded to this, pr this sermon that Peter has given. And they're, they're fellowshipping together, they're breaking bread together, they're, they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to prayer. And, hold on, I lost my place for a second. They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. And what we see them doing is they were selling their possessions and belongings and they were taking that money and they were distributing it out to each other as any had need. And we want to note that this is on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is a special day which would have brought Jews from all over uh, the Mesopotamia region to Jerusalem. So we have a lot of Jews here on the day of Pentecost who are away from their homes and they've just responded to the gospel and became Christians. They became believers and, and trying to devote themselves to being followers of Jesus Christ. And now they're deciding to stick around for a few days to have fellowship with each other. And so we have people who are away from home who don't have a place to stay. They don't have money for food. Maybe they, don't, they didn't bring enough money with them to have food. And what we see here is we see the disciples taking some of their possessions and their belongings and they're selling them and taking that money and distributing that money to everybody as they have need to help take care of each other. Believers taking care of fellow believers in this context. 
All right, let's jump down to our next passage, Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. If you turn over there with me. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with, the, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Jump even with me into chapter 5 here, the first two verses. But a man named Ananias and, his, and with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and, and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. What is the example we're seeing here? It's matching the same example we read in Acts chapter 2. They had all things in common. They're sharing and having fellowship together. And they're saying, hey, what's mine is yours. For you, If you don't have anything, hey, what's mine is yours. Feel free to use it as you have need. They're trying to, to meet the needs of all the believers that are here with them so that nobody would be needing, that they would be needing anything, whether it's a place to stay or needing a tool or just needing money for food. They're sharing with each other to meet each other's needs in this context. And again, we want to note this is believers helping other fellow believers. And we'll make some more observations about that momentarily. All right, let's jump to our third passage, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Tim Timon, and Parmenas, and Nic Nicholas, and a, pro a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. We want to notice here, back in verse 1, that there was a complaint that, was a, that had arose because there were widows that were being neglected in a daily distribution. There was a daily distribution here that we're reading of in Acts chapter 6. A daily distribution that was designed to help those who, need, who had needs. There were ne widows in need and they were being neglected. And so there was a complaint that arose. And we're going to come back to this passage momentarily when we look at the First Timothy passage. Because these two go together and help us understand another point, a principle that we need to understand when talking about church benevolence. Alright, let's jump ahead to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Paul. When we look at the context of this passage here, we're looking at the establishment of the church in Antioch. And in verse 27, we see we have some prophets who have come down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them makes uh, or foretells by the Holy Spirit that there's going to be a great famine that's going to go over, over the entire world. So what did the disciples decide to do with this prophecy, with the, knowing that the famine is going to come? We want to notice this is the church in Antioch. They have made this decision. What did they decide to do? They decided that everyone would give according to their ability to do what? To send relief 
to the brothers in Judea, knowing that this famine is going to come. So that we have this church here that is saying, we're going to set up, each one of us is going to decide that we're going to set aside some money and get ready to send it to the brothers in Jerusalem so that they're prepared when this famine comes over all the land. We also want to note here that the disciples determined this. Each disciple, they determined what they themselves were going to give. There was not a specific budget that was set. There was not a number that was set that needed to be met. Each person decided they themselves what they were going to give to help towards this effort. And then how did, how did they accomplish this? Again, each person individually was deciding to give according to their ability to send relief to the brothers of Judea. But how did they send it? Who did they send it to? According to the scripture, we see that they, they chose to send it to the elders. By who? By the hand of Barnabas and Saul. In this case, we see Barnabas and Saul fulfilling a deacon, a servant type role on behalf of this group, on behalf of the church here. Each individual decided how much they were going to give. They all pulled it together. They gave it to Barnabas and Saul, and they took it to the elders in Judea. We have this example here that we'll make some more comments on momentarily. Jump ahead with me to Romans chapter 15. We'll look at the next passage, an example of, of benevolence we see in Scripture. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 22. <clears throat> this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, Paul's writing to the Romans. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they, also, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. By way of you, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. So what do we see here from this example of Paul writing to the Romans? Well, again, we, we want to ask who? Who is doing what? Paul is delivering this collection uh, from, Ma from Macedonia and Achaia. When we look at the word Macedonia here, Macedonia is a region in the ancient world here. When we read Macedonia, what all places does this include? Well, this would include Philippi and Thessalonica. They're both in the region of Macedonia. And so Paul is, is holding a collection from these two churches, from these two areas here. And he's holding them and he's delivering this to Jerusalem. And then he also mentions here Achaia. When we read Achaia, Achaia is another region we read of in the ancient world. Achaia equates to Corinth. So we see Paul here also has the collection that he gathered from, from the church in Corinth, and he's also delivering that to the church in Jerusalem. And what is the purpose? Again, Paul's pur the purpose that the collection was made, it was for the needy saints to, in Jerusalem. He's, these churches are, are, have decided to, to give some of their money to help these poor needy saints in Jerusalem because of the famine that is going on in the land. Let's jump ahead to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. First Corinthians chapter 16, starting at verse 1. We oftentimes when we look at and, and we talk about giving and, and what we're to do on the first day of the week, we often come to this passage to read the instructions that was given. First Corinthians chapter 16, starting at verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So here we have Paul's instructions to the church in Corinth of how, how they were to go about making this happen. This is Paul's initial instructions to them. We want to note here in verse 1, it says, Now concerning the collection of the saints. I've got a note here in my Bible that indicates this phrase, now concerning, indicates that Paul is responding to a question. 
Now we don't have recorded necessarily for us what they specifically ask, but we can imply or we can infer based on what he's responding to here that he's responding to a question that the church in Corinth here has asked him about what they should be doing to help the needy saints here. Again, we don't have that recorded for us anywhere, but what we do have is this phrase indicating that he's responding to a question. At some point, the church here in Corinth has asked Paul about the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. They've asked him about it. We don't know specifically what they asked about it, if it was how to do it or if they should do it. But we see that he's responding to a question, and this is what he told them to do. As I directed the churches in Galatia, so you also are to do. And this is how you do it. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. A few other things we want to note here about Paul's instructions. He gives them the how on the first of every week to do that. But he, we also want to note in verse 3, he says, When I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry the gift to Jerusalem. Paul is not going to be the one specifically to touch the money here. He's saying, I want you to appoint for yourself someone whom you trust to take your gift to Jerusalem. Now, if he wants to come with me, since I'm heading that direction, he can come with me. But he's telling the church here, you need to appoint someone whom you trust to take your gift to the saints in Jerusalem here. Why might Paul take the time to and, and write it out this way and give them these instructions? We know by the letter of 2 Corinthians that Paul says himself that I'm not trying to, to do any shady business here. I don't want you to give all the money to me. I don't want to be accused of that I'm trying to take some of this for myself. This is your gift that is going to the needy saints of Jerusalem. And I want you to have full confidence that your gift is going to where it is intended to go. And so you appoint someone whom you trust to take it there. Someone who you approve of will make sure the gift gets it there. And if he wants to, he can come with me since I'm heading that way. We also want to note that he calls this collection a gift. When we see examples of church benevolence here, we're seeing this principle that these are brethren taking care of, taking care of fellow brethren, and it is a gift from one to the other if there's a need. Helping each other, gifting each other, uh, uh, giving a gift to each other to help based on the need is the example we're seeing here. And so these are the instructions, the example we see Paul giving to the Corinthians here. Jump ahead with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in Paul's second letter to them. Paul takes some time to talk about this some more. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting verse 1, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So here we have Paul writing to the Corinthians about what the Macedonians have done. It seems, when we look at this account here of what Paul is writing to the Corinthians, it seems that the Macedonians wanted to participate in the need and giving to the needs of the saints here. And it seems as though that Paul knows how poor these people were and it wasn't necessarily pu pushing them to have to give to the saints in Jerusalem. But it seems as though they wanted to give anyway. They wanted to give so much, they were begging Paul and begging whoever's with Paul when he's writing this letter to participate in giving of this favor, to partake, to partake in the relief of the saints. And they gave of their means and even beyond their means to help. They were very generous even though they were, they were already pretty poor. They wanted to help other Christians. And that's the example we see here Paul recording for us here in Scripture to piece together. Paul says he didn't expect them to help because, because they were so poor. But in, in fact, they still wanted to help so much, they took the time and gave beyond their means to help anyway. They really wanted to help. And what we want to note is that the Macedonians, they wanted to help. This was not 
a command that they were following. This is not, you have to do this because God says to. This was, they were doing this because they wanted to. They wanted to help the needy saints in Jerusalem. They wanted to help so much that they were even willing to give beyond their means to make sure they were helping these other saints. And what that helps us see here is, again, brethren, helping fellow brethren. And they wanted to help. They wanted to give this gift. They wanted to show their love for their, saint, for their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem through this famine. If we jump down to verse 8, we also want to notice something else here that goes along with, with this example. Verse 8 of chapter 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also, had, but also a desire to do it. So now, finishing, do it, do it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your com completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burden, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need. So their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Paul is, is urging the Corinthians here. He's saying, look at the Macedonians' example. They wanted to help. They wanted help so bad that they were willing to give beyond what they had to help these needy saints in Jerusalem. And so now he turns his, he turns his, his, uh, his speech to the Corinthians, and he's saying, this is not a command. I'm not giving you a command to help. But what I am doing is I'm urging you to affirm and show your love for these brethren. If you are in abundance when they are in need, Take the extra that you have and help these other people that you may not have any left over, but that they may also not have any lack. And he's giving them this instruction. He's, he's urging them to help and to, to have the kind of hearts that are willing to help other Christians here in need. And he's citing the Macedonians as an example here who were willing and wanted to help so much they were even willing to give beyond what they were able to make sure that these needy saints in Jerusalem had what they needed to meet their need. Let's look at the next passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and let's see what Paul writes there in the next example we see of, of the church benevolence. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which I appreciate John reading chapter 9 for us this morning, but I want to focus specifically on verses 10 through 15 here. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgivings to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of the service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of their surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Paul is t telling the Corinthians here, he's talking to them about, about their giving and helping, that if you, were, if you will be generous, this will produce many thanksgivings to God. I want you to know, he specifically notes in verse 12, that the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. He's saying if you were willing, would be willing to help these saints in Jerusalem, you're not only going to be supplying their need, but they're going to be overflowing with thanksgiving to God because of your love for God, your love for God, which has caused you to also love them that you'd be willing to help. I imagine here to, to understand what Paul is saying, you have a cup here, a goblet that is empty and it needs to be filled. And he's telling the Corinthians, if you will fill this cup, you will fill it up. And not only that, it will overflow with thanksgiving to God is the idea there. You're helping your fellow brethren in Christ who are in need. And if you do so, you're not only helping them meet their need, but you're also helping them be thankful to God. Paul is wanting to know all the good that they will be doing by helping meet the needs of these saints in Jerusalem here through their example. 
Not only that, this helps show the saints in Jerusalem the love the Corinthians have for them, which Paul was urging them back in Corinthians chapter 8. I want you to make sure you're referring, I'm urging you to show your love for them, that they're in need, that you have abundance, that you're willing to share that abundance, that their need would be met, and the helping them give more glory and, th and thanks to God through your gift to them. 1 Timothy chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Timothy chapter 5. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 here, we see instructions that Paul gave to Timothy regarding widows. You remember back in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 6, we read about there was a complaint because the, the widows were being uh, neglected in the daily distribution. There seemed to be a daily distribution giving out help to those who were in need, and there were some widows who were being neglected. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we see where the church can help support widows, but we also see where they are given specific instructions how they can help. Let's start reading in verse 3. Paul wrote to Timothy, Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has her hopes set on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has br brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. This passage is very important to our understanding of benevolence and how it can be given, because what we see here is we see instructions for how the church is to go about helping widows, people here who are in need. The instruction Paul gave to Timothy was, you have widows here, you can have younger widows and you can have older widows. The younger widows, don't enroll them, don't, don't have the church take care of them. I would have them marry, bear children and, and take care of their household and raise their children. But he's giving instructions for how and, and when they can be enrolled. If they're older than 60 and they've been the wife of one husband, they have a good reputation for good works and if she's brought up children and shown hospitality and she's washed the feet of the saints and cared for the afflicted and devoted herself to every good work, then you can enroll them. But the idea here is, if you have the responsibility to take care of a widow that in your family, you have that responsibility. It is not the responsibility of the church is, uh, it is not the responsibility of the church to take care of a widow when it is first your responsibility. The church can take care of widows if they don't have anybody else in their family to take care of them. But here we have the same principle again. We have brethren taking care of fellow brethren, and specifically members of the same family are supposed to take care of each other. That is their responsibility, to take care of each other. And if family is not around to take care of them, then if the, if the widow is, meets these, these uh, requirements, then the, the church can take care of the widows here. We think back to Acts chapter 6 of the widows being neglected in the daily distribution here. These verses go hand in hand. They, we, they had widows that needed to be taken care of, but we also see here that there's also an individual responsibility to take care of the widows, and if that responsibility it cannot be met by individuals, then the church can take care of the widows here. The church can provide if the widows meet the requirements. The instructions here make it clear when it is, when it is the responsibility of individuals here versus when the church should. And it is not that this should not be done, but it is that it is that the church, it is not the church's responsibility unless these requirements are met and unless it is nobody else's responsibility. First, responsibility applies to individuals and then the church here if there are no individuals who have this specific responsibility here. 
And the last passage I want to look at this morning before we make some observations is 3 John chapter 1, if you would turn with me there. 3 John chapter 1. In 3 John chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 5. John wrote, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. John identifies here the act of helping these brothers on their way as an act worthy of God. What does it mean that they were helping these brothers on their way? It means they're putting them up, they're, they're providing them for their needs as they come to their town. Whether they need a place to stay, whether they may need some food. These brethren that John is writing to were taking, fellow, uh, taking care of fellow brothers who were out working to further th the truth. This matches Paul's example, too, with what he see and how he responds to, to help from other churches. We know that Paul received support from the church in Philippi, and we can read about that in Acts chapter 4. I'm not going to make you turn there, but I'm going to read about it real quick. Acts chapter 4, verse 14. You can read of Paul accepting help from the Philippians. He wrote to the Philippians, Yet it was kind for you to share in my trouble. And you, Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul accepted help and support from the church in Philippi, but in contrast, he would not receive help and support from the church in Corinth. In fact, in Acts chapter 9, Paul has a whole section devoted to uh, defending himself about why he would not receive support from the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was getting very upset with Paul and, and thinking that he's out doing some shady business, because he wouldn't take their money. They wanted to help him. They wanted to supply his needs. But he says, no, I have the right to work, and I decided not to accept your help. And if I had a need, I would meet that need myself. And so he, Paul worked when he was with the Corinthians there. And so he had, he had the right to receive support from them, but he chose not to. In contrast with the Philippians here, he accepted their help when doing the work in Thessalonica. He needed help, and it seems as though they helped him multiple times. But either way, we have examples here of Christians who are helping support fellow preachers or, or people who are going out trying to further the work of, of God, spreading the truth. John identifies this act of helping these brothers on their way as an act worthy of God, and, and that would include helping them, as, helping supply their needs on their journey. So we have all these passages here, these examples of church benevolence. What are some observations we make as we look through these passages? All of these examples are examples of a church using the church's money to help other Christians. The examples we see here is they were sending help to the needy saints in Jerusalem. We see that uh, the church is here helping local saints who are poor, like for example the widows in the daily distribution. If there is a need that cannot, is not being met uh, because of the, or by the responsibility of those who have that responsibility, the church can meet those needs. But we also see that the example of the church benevolence going towards uh, supporting preachers and those who are spreading the gospel. So these are the three things, the three things in scripture that we have examples for church benevolence being allowed to, to help. When we follow the principle of authority, we, we want to ask ourselves, what does this include? What does it exclude? Again, it in, includes helping needy saints. If we have brethren across the world, we have authority from the scriptures to send and help our brethren across the world. We also have authority to help local saints who have needs. And, and first and foremost, if we as individuals have responsibilities to help them, we need to, to meet that, re that responsibility as individuals. But if there are no individuals to take care of these needs for fellow brethren, then the church can take care of, of, of that need. And we can also, uh, we also see examples in the scriptures of the church using the, the church's finances to take care of preachers or other people who are, sp are supporting the spread of the gospel. These are all the examples we have authority for in Scripture to help and to, where church benevolence is allowed. 
But we also want to ask, what does it exclude? If these are the things that it includes, everything else outside of that is excluded. Let's be more specific. What does that exclude today? That would exclude orphans' homes. That would exclude Christian organizations and, and etc. Not that these things should not be done, but that we do, simply just do not have authority to use money from the church treasury to help support these organizations. We want to make sure that when we're considering the topic of church benevolence that we follow God's authority. And the example we have in scripture are of those three things, helping needy saints, helping local saints who are poor, and supporting the work of the gospel. Those are the examples we have from scripture of following uh, church benevolence there. And to do anything outside of that would not be to follow God's authority. We also want to note from the scripture we read this morning, particularly in the passages in 2 Corinthians, that this was not a command, but these groups decided to do this. And it was equated as an act of love. These were brethren who wanted to help their fellow brethren. They loved them enough to try to help their fellow brethren to meet the needs that they had. And there's certainly a lot more that we could say about how to give and, and when to give and, and how we as, as individuals ought to give. But this morning, we're taking the time to look specifically at church benevolence. How can the church use its money? And these are the examples we see in Scripture. And we need to follow that example if we're, and how the church here decides to use its money. So I hope this morning that this has been an opportunity for you to be able to, to see from the Scriptures the examples that we have in Scripture of how the church can use this money or use its money, that we need to follow this example and not go beyond that and make sure that we're following this pattern as we try to, to be faithful to God and what we have. This morning, if you are not a Christian, we want to offer an invitation to you at this time. The scriptures teach us that Jesus Christ came down from heaven and he bore the image of man, came and he suffered and died on the cross for your sins. The scriptures teach you that, all sin, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we deserve to die for that sin. We also want to note that God is giving you a free gift, and that free gift is eternal life. All you have to do is accept the gift, just like you're getting your mail. You receive the mail. It's in your mailbox. All you have to do is go and get the mail. You have to do what the scriptures say if you want to accept this free gift of eternal life that God is offering to you. And the scriptures teach us, if you want to look at a few passages with me real quick, turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark 16 and verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. He said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus says that you need to believe and you need to be baptized. Earlier this morning, we read in Acts chapter 2 that the church, when they heard the gospel, they asked the brothers, what should we do to be saved? And Peter told them that you need to repent and be baptized in the, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There are a few things you need to do here this morning, and the church here wants to help you obey the gospel if you want to become a Christian, if you want to accept the free gift that God is offering you this morning. It is a very gener generous gift. And as we, we read a phrase back in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that I want, I want to quote back to you real quick. In the context of talking to the Corinthians about giving a gift to the needy saints in Jerusalem, Paul took the time to mention God's gift. He says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, that is God's gift to you. And he is offering to you this wonderful, this inexpressible gift. If you want to accept that gift this morning, we, we encourage you and call you to, to accept the gospel this time as we stand and sing the invitation song.